Johan, hello, this is Michael. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, are, are you getting us fine? Okay, Farhan, Mr. Mr. Dimistura will be online with you in one minute. All right. All right, we're standing by. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening in this case, late evening actually. This is Stefan de Mistura in Sochi. Over to you. Uh, hi, Mr. de Mistura. This is, this is Farhan. The, the, uh, the press here is gathered for you. And, and so I think without any further ado, I know, I know you've had a very long and late day, so we'll turn the floor over to you for comments before we uh, give it back to them for questions. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, speaking to you from Sochi, Mr. Stefan de Mistura. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me this opportunity almost in real time. Because we ended uh, our participation in terms of uh, uh, the presence here at the Sochi Congress just a few minutes ago, when I delivered the final statement, which was actually meant to ensure that uh, the UN understanding of the conclusion of the Congress would be actually consistent with what has been uh, announced. Now, the main deliverables of uh, this uh, Congress, which was uh, quite an event, more than 1,600 people, was one, the final declaration. Now, the final declaration is, uh, for us, UN Geneva process, quite important in the sense that it endorses totally the 12 points which were proposed by the UN during the Geneva rounds. That is basically a basis, shared basis, of a vision for what is called or could be a future constitution. Never done before. It was always uh, some type of doubts either from the government or opposition or others. Well, here the endorsement was clear. Second, the agreement to form a constitutional committee, now comprising government, opposition, independence, for drafting a constitution in accordance with Security Council 2254. We reiterated, and we were able to have it in the final declaration, the commitment by everyone that the ultimate goal for all what we are trying to do is actually the implementation in full of Security Council Resolution 2254. Now, the Constitutional Committee will become a reality, and here is the important point. Remember, we always have been saying we don't need a new process. We don't need any competitive process. And we've been assured that this was not going to happen. Well, we have a proof of that, because the Constitutional Committee, as approved by this uh, declaration, will become a reality in Geneva, not elsewhere, where the UN-led Geneva process will agree on uh, the proposals that the special envoy will make on mandate, terms of reference, powers, rules of procedure, and selection criteria for the composition of the Constitutional Committee in Geneva. There was also an agreed appeal 
to the UN, Geneva, to actually proceed with this task. Now, there was a list of pool, I would call it, of 50, 150 names proposed by each of the guarantors. That means Russia, Iran, and Turkey, which we would consider as candidates for such a committee. But the committee as such will very unlikely go beyond 45 or 50 names maximum. Now, since it is up to us to actually do what we have been asked to do, suggested, the only one who can ask us to do something, as you know, is the Secretary General or the Security Council. But in this this, commit, this uh, conference has actually reiterated the fact that uh, the prerogatives for doing that are assigned in their own way, but in fact are assigned by the Security Council, to the Special Envoy. So what I will do? Well, I plan to consult widely, including, I repeat, including other Syrians, including those who did not attend and consistently with 2254, myself prepare a list of 45 slash 50 people based on criteria that will be soon announced by me in Geneva based on very wide consultations. Conclusion, the declaration and empowerment by of the special envoy to establish this uh, Constitution Committee, if implemented, and we are determined to implement it, is frankly a concrete contribution to the Geneva process. Now, the devil is in the detail, we know it. The job ahead is going to be complicated, we always knew it. But frankly, we believe we can build on it. End of my comments. All right, great. And uh, now we'll uh, uh, take some questions from the floor. Uh, everyone, please uh, introduce yourselves to the speaker since he cannot see you. Yes, please. James Bayes from Al Jazeera. On behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, Special Envoy, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, can we get a little bit more detail on how this committee will work? Until now in Geneva, you've had two sides represented. In terms of the representation on the committee, are you going to try and keep it evenly balanced between the opposition and the government? And to follow on from that, when you've been negotiating, you yourself have said the government hasn't fully engaged. How are you going to be sure that the government members of a committee are going to fully engage on a committee level when they haven't previously in the negotiations? And if you don't mind, Special Envoy, I'd like to ask you again the question I asked you in December, which is, what about transition and the transitional governing body? Is that still part of your plans? You dodged my question last time. If you could answer it this time, starting with a yes or no. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, uh, good to speak to you, first of all. Um, let's start with uh, the final declaration, which uh, basically is, uh, took place here and has been reflecting completely the 12 points. If you go through the 12 points, you will see there is a lot of material for a new constitution. Second, there is at least more than once, and I did it in my speech, uh, and which should be, I think, available to you, strong reference of the following words, full implementation of 20. To 54 revolution. So I would uh, look at that as uh, an important element to answer your point. Now, balance. The balance is unavoidable when you are asking the UN to do it. That's what makes the big difference. We have uh, basically a guidance which comes from 2254, and if you look at it, you can see who are the entities, groups which have been listed by the Security Council in his own authority on how to actually guide the special envoy to do his job. And you have a list of them. Now, the secret would be, and it's going to be complicated, and because it's never easy when people feel included or excluded or not sufficiently included, that the balance will be there. But you can be sure that the, in the, since the UN is actually in charge of this, there will be a sufficient and proportionate participation 
I won't tell you how much third or non-third of the government, of the opposition, and of independence. So that uh, we will be probably be able to do quite quickly the first uh, the screening for that. Now, how can it work? Well, I know it's going to be challenging because if the government may feel that they don't want to be uh, heavily involved, that could be a problem. If the opposition feel that this is not sufficient for them, it could be a problem. But we, here I'm counting very much, I must tell you frankly, on one, on the influence that the Russian Federation and Iran and Turkey, the three guarantors, have on the implementation of what they've been strongly supporting in Sochi. The government has a lot of influence from the Russian and from Iran to actually engage, because otherwise we would have a demonstration that Sochi did not produce something concrete. And I think there is a vested interest, and I heard it today, to actually show that Sochi did produce something concrete, which then Geneva is picking up and then making it even more concrete. Majid. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Majid Gilli, Rudao Media Network. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Dumasura, for this press conference. I want to ask you about uh, the recent development in Syria, which is the Turkish operation in Afrin. How did that impact your work, uh, especially given the timing of it? It was uh, right before uh, the Vienna. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? And also, is there any hope at this point to finally invite the Kurds to the Geneva or now Vienna process. Thank you very much. There was, a, a, when I asked the organizers, the guarantors, whether the Afrin uh, um, events and the situation is affecting Sochi, the Turks, the Iranians, and the Russians did tell me that they were going to do all their best to avoid that that would have an impact, um, at least among them. And the proof is that uh, it did work out. The, none of those potential tensions did appear in Sochi. I do understand that uh, some of the Kurdish representatives were meant to come to Sochi apparently did not come because of what is happening. They were Kurds anyway. Now, on the, the Constitution, there is no question everybody knows, and that's totally logical, that when a new Constitution will be drafted, everyone who is a Syrian and does represent a reality on the ground in terms of local people would have a chance to contribute to it. The floor is yours. Okay, Talal. <coughs> uh, Talal Hajj from yes. Al Arabiya News Channel. Hello, Mr. Masura. Um, Hello. Uh, you have been dodging the question of the transitional period and the transitional um, uh, governing body. Uh, according to many in the Middle East, uh, there should be a transitional period third with a transitional body with full powers, and then the writing of the constitution and the elections. You seem to be putting the horse before the cart, they say. So um, what, what do you say to them? Will there be a, a transitional period and transitional body, or you're omitting this? And uh, can you assure us that the HNC will have a big say in the constitutional committee that you are forming in Geneva? Um, first of all, they are not called the HNC anymore, but SNC, as you know. They, are, uh, they, they were not present in the Sochi conference. But um, I must tell you one thing, that uh, even the government as such was not present. There were many, and I know them, many representatives of the government, so they cannot pretend they were not there. <laughs> and they were there, and there were many people that the government has actually brought to uh, the Sochi. But uh, if one would say that uh, since the SNC was not present, therefore they would not have a say or involvement in the follow-up, that could apply even to the government, since officially they were not present. Bottom, but that's legal argument. The reality 
is that uh, the uh, I am bound, and I am more than willing to uh, implement what 2254 says. And you know very well that uh, the Syrian uh, the opposition is very well identified in 2254. So they will have, even since, even due to the, even in spite of the fact that they have not been present as such in Geneva, uh, in Sochi, they will have a very substantial participation to this Constitutional Commission. But that, the criteria are up to me, based on consultation, and I will uh, indicate them very soon. Edie? You, uh, now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The issue about transition, the issue about transition. Well, you must know that we are insisting and insisting on the fact of 2254. No change on that. Having said that, if the issue of transition seems to be complicated at this very moment, are we going to ignore the fact that there is an opportunity for actually having a constitutional committee that may reform or even change or write a new constitution and that that will lead to a possible UN-led or UN-supervised elections, both presidential and parliamentary, while we are saying that there is a need for a neutral and safe environment in Syria, if you look at it carefully, you would see that there is a lot there that can be worked on in the right direction. Uh, no, no, uh, we got a lot of hands. Evie. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Damis Dora, Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. A couple of follow-up questions. Can you give us a sense of your timetable? Um, when might we see uh, this um, constitutional committee meeting for the first time? Is this something that's going to take weeks, months? And was there... Um, discussion or any agreement on a ceasefire. And we know that Foreign Minister Lavrov was there for Russia. Um, who was there from Iran and from Turkey of senior officials to sort of put their imprimatur on, on this agreement? OK. Let me start with this last point so I don't forget it. Uh, Iran was represented by the senior deputy foreign minister and uh, Turkey was represented by the deputy, senior deputy foreign minister in charge of the file of Syria. Regarding ceasefire, uh, there was some announcement of intention of doing it. There has been certainly not enough of that. What you can see in my statement, I've been insisting that uh, a, a sustainable ceasefire is needed. I am sure that uh, everyone would have been much happier, and we were the first ones to ask for it, that during Sochi, or like when we have Geneva talks, or when there is Astana, ceasefire become more of a concrete reality than they are. That was partially true, but not sufficient. And we did mention it both bilaterally, privately, and publicly. In terms of timetable, I've learned that uh, fixing timetable in the Syrian environment is uh, quite a risky thing. You remember the 2254 timetable, six months, eight months, and all that? So I will not indicate a timetable. What I can say is what I did say after the, my intervention today, as soon as possible. And frankly, I do feel that the one must hit the iron while it's hot when we have this critical mass moving. So I will be soon letting you know and let everyone know, certainly Security Council, how we will proceed in order to not miss the opportunity of verifying what, in fact, we believe we have in our hand at the moment. Over to you. Okay. Oleg? Um, thank you, Alex Zelenin with TASS News Agency. Mr. De Mistura, as a follow-up to my colleague's question, um, whether when the, this Constitution uh, Commission, this um, structure will begin working is one question. When do you plan, when do you intend to present the list of the participants of this Commission? And uh, also, when do you plan to report on what was happening in Sochi to the members of the Security Council? And will you... Uh, 
name any possible timetable on convening another round of talks in Geneva or Vienna. Thank you. Um, as I just tried to explain, timetables put abstractly, like uh, you have been indicating, when am I meeting the Secret Council? When will I have the first meeting of the, uh, the Constitutional Committee? When will I select all of them? I will let you know once I am ready. What you should know is that every month I do brief the Security Council, so the dates are relatively soon. Secondly, there is uh, a intention on my side with, I think, the support of all the countries who are interested in seeing progress on the Council Committee to actually have the work on it. Then I would also say that we intend to have the next round of the traditional UN Geneva talks. As you know, the Constitutional Committee, let's be clear, is going to be a specific project, if you want to call it, and a specific composition. But that doesn't mean that we are suspending or not insisting on the regular meetings on the Geneva talks, of the Geneva talks, which hopefully may be energized by seeing that there is a progress on a very specific area, such as the Constitutional Commission. Over to you. Carol? Mr. Demistura, I'm Carol Landry with Agence France Presse. If I could just get you to spell out, why do you think this Constitutional Committee can achieve something that nine rounds of Vienna talks have not achieved? What's in there that gives you any kind of indication of some possibility for progress? The main reason is that uh, we never had the government side and the opposition actually getting involved into the discussion of a new constitution. Because they were not even agreeing on the possibility of creating a constitutional commission, which then would be left to the UN to set the agenda. I think we have reached that point. Also because countries who have an influence on both sides are apparently, and we have approved today, at least uh, in Sochi, determined to actually insist that the government and the opposition, and we have to do that work too from the countries who have an influence, including us, frankly, on the opposition, to actually engage. That is why I believe we are going from theory into practice. Time will tell. They will listen in detail. It's going to be uphill. We all know it. But we are actually going to establish a constitutional committee. Never before that was done, and we will be in that direction. Thank you, uh, Mr. Demistura. Um, Ali Barada from uh, Sharq al Awsat uh, newspaper and from France 24. Um, you're talking about the realities on the ground. Do you think that uh, President Assad is achieving? Uh, a victory in the war, one. Second, do you believe that uh, the, uh, according to the uh, resolution 2254, uh, that the foreign powers and the foreign elements in the Syrian war should uh, withdraw this time now? Thank you. First of all, I think we have said it many times, History will clearly prove it, as has been done in the past. No one in this terrible, awful conflict can claim, will claim, has claimed victory, military victory. Because what you need to do is actually win the peace. Why? Because we know very well, and if you look on the ground, there is a country which is still de facto partitioned. There are still a lot of fighting and conflict. And above all, there is not yet rehabilitation, reconstruction. And all that can only come not by winning militarily, but engaging in a political process inclusive. And how do you do that? Constitution, elections, like anywhere else. Adelamid. 
Thank you, Mr. Demistura. Abdul Hamid Sayam from the Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. Marhaba, Mr. Demistura. Kifa. Uh, thank you. My question, Mr. Demistura, is about the humanitarian situation in Syria, if it has been discussed. As you know, in uh, eastern Ghouta, there is thousands of people are besieged for over two years. There are 400 who need immediate evacuation for medical reasons. In Idlib, there are 200,000 who had been displaced recently, and let alone what's going on in, Af in Afrin in the north. So the situation on the ground says that at least six and a half million Syrians who need immediate attention for, hum uh, for a humanitarian assistance. Had this issue been discussed in Sochi, had been any at least some goodwill gesture to ease the situation, to allow the UN to send the humanitarian uh, shipments they are trying to do? Thank you. We have definitely raised it. But as you know, this was raised and clearly raised by the humanitarian coordinator of the UN in his own briefing at the Security Council, where all the countries who have an influence, most of them, at their own Syrian developments are present. So the short answer is, yes, it was raised. But the focus this time as far as we could see, and that's what we focused ourselves on, was on the Constitutional Commission. While if you look at my statement, you will see a reference not only on the humanitarian side, not only on the actual issue of a ceasefire, but also the issue about the detainees that you didn't raise, because it is also a very tragic detainees, displaced, and missing people. Syria needs a lot of improvement in both areas, and I do realize your concern. It is ours as well. Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Demister. I'm Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Uh, I just wanted just to clarify um, on the Constitutional Committee, you will come up with the criteria and you will choose who is going to be the 45 or 50 people on this committee? The answer is yes, okay, but I will do that, of course, in consultation and according to 2254, because we are a, not a dictatorship here. We are guiding a, a, a process, and we are being asked and we are accepted to actually be actively involved in all element, not only the rules of procedure, not only the actual implementation of the meetings, the agenda, but also the selection criteria. Thank you. And just a, just a quick follow-up. Um, it sounds like it was a, a rather interesting day there with uh, some issues with flags. The Russian foreign minister was heckled. Did any uh, Russian officials indicate to you that they might be more than happy for you to take the peace talks back to Geneva? <laughs> well, it was certainly a very intense event. 1,600 people, Syrians, who for perhaps many of them for the first time had the opportunity of expressing their opinion. And uh, uh, at the beginning, and even when I made my statement, I must say none of them interrupted me. And there was even a, uh, I would say, a supportive message. But uh, it was uh, a very, uh, not chaotic, but extremely uh, dense uh, movement. Uh, you know, um, that is what you do when you are asking 1,600 people to actually come to a dialogue. And uh, in Syria and outside in particular. So we were not surprised, and it was nothing that disrupted the actual proceeding, I have to say. Over to you. Nabil. Thank you, Mr. Demistura Nabil Abisab, Al Hurra TV station correspondent. Alan. You're talking. Alan. Thank you. You're talking about uh, 45 to 50 names uh, for the committee. Are these names uh, all represented or uh, participating now in Sochi, or we're talking about 
names uh, people who are not necessarily there. And uh, the third that will represent the opposition, is it going to be uh, from the opposition inside Syria and outside Syria? Or what opposition we're talking about? Well, first of all, you, you, you should not now start prejudging my work for uh, the identification of the criteria. So I will not go into details on that, frankly, because it's going to be a delicate thing. What I can tell you is that it's clear, and that is an understanding with uh, the guarantors, that uh, when I will be going through the criteria, that will not be reflecting exclusively, actually, uh, the, quite uh, uh, the, the contrary, in the sense, not only, the, those who attended Sochi. And it will be, and I have the prerogative of including and adding as many as required by the criteria will come up, those who are outside and were not there for whatever reason. So that's all I can tell you at this stage, but I will not go into further details. Benny? Uh, Benny Avni of the New York Post. Uh, Yesterday, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel was in, uh, in Moscow meeting uh, President Putin, and he warned against uh, Iranian presence in Syria. Uh, the question is, he said that Israel will not allow such presence. The question is, since this could uh, put a major monkey wrench into any diplomatic uh, outcome in Syria, uh, does that figure into your, to, uh, into the talk? Did, did it figure into the talk in Sochi, and will it figure in other talks? No, it did not, to my knowledge, figure in the talks. Perhaps it was in the bilateral discussion between uh, the Russian Federation. The, you know, Lavrov was, uh, Sergei Lavrov was uh, there and met uh, the Turkish for deputy foreign minister and the Iranian deputy foreign minister, and I met him several times today, but that didn't come up. So second, any type of military in, in involvement increased or new military activity from whatever side inside Syria or related to Syria certainly complicates any type of political process. We have seen it all the time. And uh, it has happened in the past. But um, at this moment, that was not discussed. Over to you. Okay. Yes, uh, Beytul Yürük, Turkish News Agency, Anadolu. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Demistura. Uh, my, uh, I, I just have a follow-up on Michelle's question. You mentioned uh, that uh, you would consult with the parties to choose the members of the Constitutional Committee. At the end, uh, will uh, the members of the committee need to be uh, approved by any parties or any countries? Thanks. I will be consulting and engaging everyone, but at the end of the day, as per 2254, the prerogative ends up with, uh, the, frankly, uh, the special envoy. Matthew. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, the Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access, thanks for calling in. It would be yes. good if other envoys did it. I wanted to know, uh, there was at least one article, maybe it's incorrect, but it seems to say that the, the Turkish delegation has submitted a list of 50 candidates for these posts. Could you say, is that the case? Has anyone started giving you names? And also, although it'll be under the auspices of the UN, how is it going to be paid for when it actually convenes? Uh, is, there going to be, is this coming from the UN budget? Are you going to be soliciting funds from, from various countries? How, how will it work? Thanks a lot. Okay. But you, I must tell you that the, uh, the way this uh, list, I would call, of the pool of candidates to be submitted to the special envoy in Geneva, and as I said, not excluding at all also others who are not in that pool, was based, from what my understanding, on a agreement between Iran, Russia, and Turkey that each of them would come up with 50 names. So that confirms your theory. Not only Turkey, but uh, Russia and Iran, each of them came up with uh, 50 names of people they consider appropriate to be considered as members of a pool of candidates for this. Uh, Bear in mind that, uh, as we said, the total number 
I would imagine for a reasonable, workable constitutional commission would not be beyond more 45 or 50, otherwise <laughs> we get the General Assembly there. So uh, the, even uh, you can see that there will be a lot of screening from one side or the other, from ourselves, in order also to ensure that others who are not in Sochi would be included. Okay. Uh, last question. Now, cost. We have a budget. We have a budget, and the budget is uh, meant to support events such as the Geneva talks. And uh, I think that uh, when we have or not have a Geneva meeting, the support to the Constitutional Commission would be, in fact, part of those activities. So to a large degree, it would be part and of what has already been foreseen as the UN budget for the Special Envoy's Office. If we will need more, we will obviously go back to the SABQ, to the General Assembly, but for the moment, that is, I would see it as part of our current duties and therefore current budget. Uh, last question, George. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your briefing, sir. Good evening. George Baumgarten, correspondent for. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, for, among other media, the Astana Times in Kazakhstan. Uh, you mentioned just in passing the Astana process. Can you tell me? Uh, tell us how it fits in with your efforts. Is it competitive with them in any way, or do you feel it ca could be complementary with your efforts in Sochi, Geneva, elsewhere? Thank you. Well, the starting point is that I think everyone, those who organize the Astana meetings, those who are in the organized the Sochi meetings, all concur because they are, by the way, members of the Security Council, that the decision by the Security Council to have the UN-led Geneva talks are the only one which have the credibility and the legitimacy for actually pursuing the political process. Now, having said that, now I give you an example. The Astana in the meetings in my modest opinion, have been extremely helpful, and I've been attending them, as you know, because they have been focusing on a very surgical, specific area called de-escalation. And God knows if the Syrians didn't need that. And God knows if a Geneva talks are not helped if there is an atmosphere of de-escalation. So that is the way I look at Astana, and frankly, with interest, and frankly, with gratitude. But they have a surgical identity. Over to you. All right. Uh, do, we have, uh, do we have any time for any more questions? Or, I, or, uh, sh uh, I, I, I'm afraid I not. I just want to remind you it's the 12 midnight 010 here oh. in Sochi. Yeah. And I started at uh, 6.25 this morning. Oh, th th thank, thank you so much for your very long day. I really appreciate it. H have a good evening, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.